Welcome to our next major unit in energy metabolism, biochemical energy generation and utilization. In this section, we'll discuss why ATP is such an important energy molecule and the role it plays in neuronal signaling. Many times throughout your education in biology and chemistry, you have undoubtedly been told that ATP is the energy currency of the cell and that the mitochondria is the energy powerhouse where ATP production occurs. In this course, we will spend a significant amount of time dedicated to understanding these processes. But before we focus on the production of ATP, let's get a better sense for why ATP and other nucleotide triphosphates are so important in cellular function. All of the ribonucleotide phosphates that serve as the monomer subunits for the synthesis of RNA also have a major role in the energy requiring processes within the body. ATP is the predominant one, but as we have seen in our discussions on glycogen regulation and biosynthesis, GTP and UTP are also utilized in processes requiring energy. Similarly, some biochemical reactions also require CTP as a cofactor. NTP currency is utilized to perform a great many functions within the body. The first is the utilization of energy released by NTP hydrolysis to drive forward enzymatic reactions that would normally be unfavorable and endergonic. Recall that the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and PI release a lot of energy. In fact, the hydrolysis of one mole of ATP will release approximately negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole or negative 30.5 kilojoules per mole. When coupled with other reactions, this energy release can often drive reactions forward. We saw an example of this in glycogen biosynthesis. The glycogen synthase enzyme requires that the glucose molecule to be added to the nascent glycogen chain must first be activated to the UDP glucose form. The UDP serves as a good leaving group in the formation of the glycosidic linkage between the one position carbon of the incoming glucose and the four position oxygen of the glycogen chain. Otherwise, if the anomeric hydroxyl group of glucose needed to be hydrolyzed in an unmodified form, the formation of the glycosidic bond would be an endergonic and non-spontaneous reaction. Many enzymatic reactions require the activation of one of the substrates by making an NTP derivative. Can you think of other reactions that use this mechanism? Watch for new ones in the coming lessons. In addition to the familiar NTPs, coenzyme A is a modified nucleotide containing molecule that is also utilized as an intermediate and or substrate in many reactions. The thiol functional group serves as the attachment point for these reactions. You will often see it abbreviated as coash in reactions. The CoA part for coenzyme A and the inclusion of the thiol functional group, SH, which is the reactive portion of the molecule rather than the phosphate group seen in the NTPs. NTPs can also serve as phosphate donors for kinase reactions. One of the most recent examples we've seen this term is the phosphorylation of glucose at the sixth position following entry into the cell. This is mediated by the hexokinase enzyme. Cellular signaling pathways require NTPs for a multitude of functions, including the movement of receptors or receptor activated proteins within the plasma membrane, the generation of second messengers and the phosphorylation of downstream targets, to name a few. This has been exemplified most recently in the glucagon signaling pathway that has utilized a G protein bound to GTP to activate the adenylyl cyclase enzyme that generates the cyclic AMP molecule from ATP. 
The second messenger, cyclic AMP, activates a cascade of kinase enzymes such as protein kinase A that utilize ATP as a phosphate donor within the reaction mechanism. In fact, I don't believe that I know of a signaling cascade that doesn't utilize multiple NTPs during the process. One of the greatest uses of NTPs within the body is to maintain the function of the brain. Neuronal signaling and other brain functions use roughly 20% of the body's energy resources. To understand the energy demands of the brain, it is important to understand the structure and function of neurons. As depicted in the diagram, the neuron has a central cell body called the soma, as well as dendrite and axon projections. The dendrites of the neuron are typically where the outside signals are received and the axon is used to transmit the chemical signals to downstream target cells in the communication pathway. Interestingly, the cell bodies of neurons are found in bundles called ganglia located within the central nervous system or the brain and spinal cord. This means that the axon projections can be very long, a meter or more in length to reach from the base of the spinal cord all the way down to the toes. Thus, the axons of many neurons are wrapped by small cells called Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. Schwann cells contain a large amount of plasma membrane, allowing the cells to wrap themselves around the axon. This forms a lipid insulator known as a myelin sheath. Damage to these sheath forming cells can lead to the loss of myelination and cause disease states such as multiple sclerosis. Neurons engage in cell to cell communication by sending positive electrical signals called action potentials down the axon projection to the axon terminals. Once at the terminal, the action potential initiates the fusion of secretory vesicles with the plasma membrane and the release then of neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft or the small space in between the axon terminal and downstream target cell. Neurotransmitters are small organic molecules that interact with receptors on the dendrite or the soma of the postsynaptic neuron and can either inhibit or activate further action in the downstream target cell. For this positive electrical signal to be propagated through a neuron and down the axon, the neuron is required to set up a signaling potential within the cell. This involves setting up a concentration gradient of positive sodium ions outside of the cell and positive potassium ions on the inside of the cell. In addition, the overall resting state of most neurons is highly negative compared to the extracellular matrix with a resting potential near negative 70 millivolts. The major energy usage of the neuron is in maintaining and resetting the resting state of the neuron after an action potential has occurred. We will investigate the mechanism used to form the sodium and potassium concentration gradients. To set up the concentration gradients, the membrane of neurons contains many protein pumps that generate concentration gradients of ions on the outside and inside of the cell. The primary pump is called the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump uses the energy of ATP to pump three sodiums out of the cell and two potassiums into the cell for every ATP molecule that is hydrolyzed. Thus, chemical gradients occur with high concentrations of sodium outside of the cell and high concentrations of potassium on the inside of the cell. Gradients hold a lot of potential energy. You can think of it like creating a dam that contains water. When water is released from the dam, gravity will cause the water to flow from the dam at a high rate, releasing energy that can be used to do work, such as generating electricity. 
Similarly, when a concentration gradient of ions is released, it will flow down its concentration gradient to areas in low supply and release lots of energy in the process. It's this flow of the ions from one location to another that allows the generation of an action potential within the neuron. This diagram shows the action of the sodium-potassium ATPase pump in more detail. The pump acts as a carrier protein rather than a channel protein. That means that rather than forming a pore where molecules can flow to the other side, this protein works to carry molecules from one side to the other by shifting into different structural conformations. The pump begins by binding with a molecule of ATP, creating an enzyme 1 ATP complex as indicated above. In the E1 state, there is an opening to the cytoplasmic side of the cell. Three sodium ions from the cytoplasm join the complex, causing an alteration in the protein structure, such that the cytoplasmic opening is now blocked and the sodium ions are trapped inside. This triggers the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. Dissociation of ADP causes the pump to change conformation into the E2 state, opening the pump towards the extracellular side and releasing the three sodium ions. Two potassium ions from the extracellular side bind in the cleft, and the cleft closes. ATP association with the enzyme in the second conformation plus the potassium causes the release of potassium into the cytoplasm and the enzyme is reset for another round. Once the sodium and potassium gradients are created, the neuron is ready to activate an action potential. This can be accomplished within two to three milliseconds. Once the ion gradients are set up, an action potential can be generated within a neuron. This begins when a neurotransmitter from an upstream neuron is released into the synaptic cleft, resulting in the binding of the neurotransmitter to the receptor-activated ion channel on the target neuron. The diagram shows in part A a receptor in its closed conformation during the resting state of the neuron. Note that similar to sodium, calcium ions are also in high concentration outside of the cell. When neurotransmitters are released from the axon into the synapse, they will bind with the receptor, causing a conformational change in the receptor that opens the calcium ion channel. Calcium flows into the cell down its concentration gradient causing localized depolarization within the cell. As the neuron moves towards a neutral charge state in the localized area, the voltage-gated sodium channels undergo a conformational change, opening the sodium channel and allowing the influx of sodium into the cell. When the cellular charge overshoots and becomes positive, approximately plus 30 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channel closes due to an additional conformational change and enters what is called an absolute refractory period where it cannot be reactivated to send an additional action potential. If the depolarization signal is strong enough, the activation of sodium channels will lead to the activation of other downstream voltage-gated sodium channels and thereby propagate the signal down the dendrites and through the cell body towards the axon. The absolute refractory period of the voltage-gated sodium channels keeps the signal from going backwards. If a depolarization event of at least negative 55 millivolts reaches the axon hillock located at the top of the axon, then an action potential will be sent to a downstream target cell. Action potentials sent down the axon are all or nothing. Once the axon hillock has reached the threshold potential 
the neuron is now committed to sending the signal to the neighboring cell. So what happens after depolarization? The voltage-gated potassium channels are also present within the plasma membrane of neurons. They are closed during the resting state of the neuron and do not open until the polarity of the cell shifts to approximately plus 30 millivolts. Following activation, Potassium ions move out of the cell, down their concentration gradient, and restore the resting potential of the neuron to negative 70 millivolts. This charged state within the neuron resets the resting state conformation of the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, and the absolute refractory period has passed. However, a full depolarization event cannot be generated again until the ion gradients are also reset. These gradients are restored by the sodium-potassium ATPase. The period of time that it takes the sodium-potassium ATPase to restore the sodium and potassium gradients after a depolarization event is called the relative refractory period. During the relative refractory period, a new signal can be sent. However, it will not be as strong as the normal signal because the sodium movement into the cell and therefore depolarization will be minimal until the gradient is also restored. This is a graphic representation of an action potential. The resting state of the neuron is negative 70 millivolts. If signaling at the dendrites is large enough, an action potential is propagated down the axon. This occurs when a threshold of negative 55 millivolts is reached at the axon hillock, which is located at the base of the axon in the cell body. This causes the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels along the axon and the release of neurotransmitter from the axon terminal. The voltage-gated sodium channels close and become refractory when the cell potential reaches plus 30 millivolts. This also results in the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels, which re-establish the resting state potential of the neuron to negative 70 millivolts. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump restores the sodium and potassium gradients within the neuron during the relative refractory period and enables the neuron to fully reset and fire another action potential. Overall, brain function requires approximately 20% of the body's energy. Most of this energy is used to reset the sodium and potassium gradients following a depolarization event. However, in the next section, we will also see that neurons can have a high energy demand to move neurotransmitters from the cell body down to the axon terminal.